Every so often we hear about what's happened to some of the people we've met in our stories over the years. But few of those updates have been more surprising than the one we're going to tell you about now. It's a story the Fifth Estate first covered in 1982. It was in the depths of the Cold War, and a KGB agent codenamed Gideon had got into Canada to spy for the Soviet Union. His real name was Evgeny Brick. His mission, covert operations for his communist bosses. But instead, he fell in love with the wife of a Canadian soldier who persuaded Brick to turn himself in to the authorities in Ottawa, which is how he became a double agent. Oh, this was huge. This was the biggest case they had, and maybe even to this day. Legendary Canadian journalist John Sawatsky has written extensively about the RCMP and spying in Canada. It was the biggest case because uh, Gideon was an, what's called an illegal. The illegals are, the, are people who take a false identity. They slip into the country uh, and, and assume the identity of a, a dead person or somebody who's left the country. You know, and there's no way to trace them. Gideon betrayed his country, spying for the RCMP, sharing secrets with Canada about his Soviet masters. But then, in another incredible twist, Gideon himself was betrayed by an RCMP officer. The Mounties' name was James Morrison, a corporal at RCMP headquarters in Ottawa. For a few thousand dollars from the Soviets, Morrison exposed Gideon. Then, in 1955, Gideon was called back to Moscow, and everyone believed his execution. I mean, it was just assumed he'd been executed. You know, I, I bought that assumption, you know. And, uh, uh, and I think the Mounties accepted that. That saga of betrayal and treachery lay buried for three decades. But then in 1982, James Morrison, wearing an awkward disguise, decided to come forward and speak publicly to Fifth Estate host Eric Mallet. Do you think there's any doubt he was killed? I wouldn't know, but uh, that uh, would appear to me to be their standard policy. How, how do you describe what you did? What word would you use? The word traitor? <laughs> well, you can do what you like with that. What do you do with that word? I do nothing with it. Is it your word? Is it a word for you? I don't consider it a word for me. Why not? I don't. Why not? I'm not uh, going to belabor the point. I'm just saying I don't. You took one of the most sensitive operations Canadian security had ever run, an opportunity to find out about Soviet intelligence. It probably resulted in a man being killed. You did it for $3,500 paid to you by the Soviets, and you don't consider yourself a traitor? I wouldn't apply that word. Whether James Morrison wanted to describe himself that way or not was irrelevant. Following our broadcast, he was arrested, put on trial, and convicted. A former RCMP officer, James Morrison, has been sentenced to 18 months in jail. In the 1980s, Peter Cronin was one of Morrison's defense lawyers. Today, he laments his client's decision to appear on the Fifth Estate. I would have told him on no uncertain terms, don't go on that show. He'd have nothing to gain and everything to lose. In the end, for selling out the identity of Canada's most important double agent, James Morrison never went to prison. He spent only a few months in a halfway house before being released. And even his own lawyer assumed the man Morrison had betrayed, the spy codenamed Gideon, had been executed by the Soviets long before. At that point, what did you believe had happened? Well, I mean, we really didn't know because, of course, at that point, the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union and information, the flow of information out of the Soviet Union was, was heavily guarded. Uh, we were, we were uh, operating on the assumption that he probably had been executed. But whatever the conventional wisdom had been for years, in 1992, four decades after Gideon last was seen and presumed dead, something astounding would happen that no one saw coming. Former Canadian security officer Don Mahar was at CISA's headquarters in Ottawa that day. 
tell me about that phone call. That was my director general, uh, Jeffrey O'Brien, calling me down to his private office. Called and said, listen, we've got something we would like you to look at. And uh, Jeffrey handed me this telegram that had just come in from London, England. And as I read it, the first thing I thought is that they were joking with me. British intelligence had contacted Canadian security officials after a man appeared at the UK embassy in Lithuania claiming to be Gideon, the double agent believed killed in Moscow so many years before. To Don Mahar, it seemed impossible at first. And they said, look, go down into the archives and we need three questions that only this man can answer and nobody else. So these are gonna be the, the proof that he was in fact still alive. Yes, that's right, Bob. To determine if the man at the British Embassy was telling the truth, Don Mahar researched questions about Gideon's ill-fated Canadian romance, for which only the real Gideon could have answers. And the answers that you got back were? Picture perfect. They were absolutely precise. So Gideon, presumed executed by the Soviets decades before, was in fact alive. Now they had to figure out how to bring him safely back to Canada. I went back and forth to London with those plans. Um, they would sit there, we would discuss them, they made them better. After months of planning, Evgeny Brik was secretly spirited away from the former Soviet Union into the West, then on to Canada. There is that photograph in Stockholm of, of you in the hotel room with him, and there's a bottle of champagne on, on the table. Can you recall what that feeling was? Yes, I do. It, it was the uh, end of the exfiltration. We ended up in Stockholm, Sweden, um, and that uh, it was a tremendous weight off everybody's shoulders. And none of us wanted to be responsible if this went badly and he got arrested again. In the immediacy of his flight from the Soviets, Gideon seemed overcome with emotion. He was elated. He, he was like a child. He uh, couldn't thank us enough. Journalist and author John Sawatsky recalls his response when he eventually heard the news of Gideon's survival. Incredulous, because you know, uh, it, it was so widely assumed. You know, that he had been executed. First of all, even to be sent to the Gulag as opposed to being executed was, was a surprise in itself. And then to survive it and come back and, and quote, escape back to Canada. I mean, this, this was quite a coming around. Once back in Canada, Evgeny Brick, the double agent known as Gideon, never did reunite with the woman for whom he'd betrayed his country. He died in Ottawa in 2009. James Morrison, the Mountie who betrayed Gideon, lived out his final years alone. After his release from custody, he eventually moved to the basement apartment of this house in Victoria, BC. Morrison's lawyer, Peter Cronin, still practices law in the capital and only learned this year from us that the man betrayed by his client had not, in fact, been executed in Moscow. I was thrilled to hear uh, that he wasn't. So it's, it's a nice thing to hear at this stage. He recalls his final meeting with James Morrison, who seemed almost relieved the secrets of his betrayal were finally out. And one thing that really stayed with me it was the first time I saw him smile. And so I think that uh, ultimately, I, f I think he felt like um, he was able to lift this incredible burden off of his shoulders and, uh, and get on with the balance of his life. James Morrison died in 2001. He was cremated, his ashes scattered in an unmarked common grave. There was no music, no eulogy, no prayers. His younger son was the only person present though he apparently had neither forgotten nor forgiven his father's treason. It seems James Morrison would often use his little boy as a kind of decoy on his spy missions. Morrison used to take him out in the family car 
and uh, go to uh, KGB meets with his son there. The reason being that if the watcher service would see Morrison going by with family in the car, well, he's not going to be doing anything that he shouldn't be. And so uh, this younger son uh, identified three separate times and three separate places that Morrison took him um, during his Russian meets. That says something. <laughs> sure does. But they're both traitors, right? They both betrayed their countries uh, for, for reasons that are the lowest reason you can have, you know, for personal gain. That, that's why you're betraying other people. And uh, both of them had taken an oath, both of them had signed documents to, you know, uh, to, to remain secret, and, and both of them had violated that. The difference is one is our traitor, the other is their traitor. If you're curious about what's become of many of the other people we've interviewed after the Fifth Estate cameras went away, we hope to feature more updates in a future episode. And of course, we're always looking for new stories to investigate. So please get in touch with us with your tips and suggestions at fifthtips at cbc.ca. Dr. Quarren. We'll ask the tough question. Doctor, you can't simply walk away. These families deserve some answers. You as a reporter want to make up some bullshit. We'll show you the drama. Get out of the car. And we'll bring you the unforgettable interviews. You had a video of, of the mayor of Toronto smoking crack. What about my life? What about black people's lives? We matter. No justice, no peace. Again, send us your ideas and suggestions at fifthtips at cbc.ca.